just commercial interest. And Olympia hadn't allowed that to happen. And so it was the very first voter initiative. So three person elected commission with the second largest uh, public utility in the state after uh, uh, Seattle City, Seattle Light. And we're the 13th largest in the nation. So um, in public power, you have one of the bigger utilities. We have about 1,100 employees and we serve just under a million people. So we have uh, three commissioners. I'm the commissioner um, from North County, Camino Island and Everett area. These are areas of equal population or equal voters. We have one commissioner just for Edmonds and Linwood and one commissioner for South County. So we have to reside in these areas and we run in the primary in these areas, but we're elected from all of Snohomish County and Camino Island. So, and people ask, well, the number one question I get is, what's a commissioner? What's a PUD? Most people don't know they have PUD commissioners. So, which is maybe a good thing. So, uh, and I say, it's very much like a school board, right? You've got some, uh, government things you have to do, some uh, per, you know, approving budgets, those kinds of things. Um, rates is one big thing set by the commission, and we haven't raised, had a general rate increase in four years. So, um, but the, you know, the real important thing is to make sure, just like in a school district, we hire a great leader. So that's, it's uh, different from a city council, but it's much more like a school district. So we meet twice a month. Right now we're meeting virtually. We were just about to emerge from that. And now we're, we're not going to, we're gonna stay virtual for a while. We actually have better attendance virtually. So I wanted to show you how uh, every dollar of your PUD bill, what it goes towards. So about half of it goes to buying energy. We are Bonneville Power Administration's biggest customer. And so the, the, about 80% of our power we get is from Bonneville. So Bonneville was made for public utilities and our utility was really made for Bonneville. So uh, we spent a lot of time working with Bonneville, helping them to do things to keep rates down. Um, about 14, 15% is capital expenses. Some of these are for growth, but a lot of these are just to maintain uh, uh, a robust system. Uh, you know, a good example here uh, is a few years ago, we rebuilt the Eagle Creek substation just east of the hospital. So the old substation was about 40 years old. We were having lots of outages. And so now we now have a new, more robust substation. So we're, we're putting redundant transmission lines up to the Stanwood Camano area. So that's about 15% is just capital. And then about 25% is all other operations. And so this is running our own hydro projects. This is our employees, linemen's wages, uh, our customer service folks, uh, a little bit of uh, overhead for administration. And then 8% is taxes. And then 3% is energy efficiency programs. And you might say, why is the PUD involved in energy efficiency? Well, the, we've learned a long time ago that it's, uh, it's a better bang for the buck, for your buck, because it's your bucks, to help customers become more energy efficient than it is to go out and procure new sources of, of power. So, and in fact, energy efficiency is what got me excited in the PUD. When I worked at the school district, the PUD helped us relight all the gymnasiums. Every gymnasium in this district was relit with PUD dollars and many of the schools, the classrooms and stuff, and to really substantial savings for the district. And so when I had the opportunity, I'm just enough of a nerd to think, well, I'd like to do that. So I'm really uh, proud of how we uh, helped our customers and how we kept the lights on during the pandemic. So we realized right away whether government called our workers essential or not, they were essential. And we had to provide an essential service and we had to figure out how, because you know what, when we start, started out, we didn't know how transmissible it was, how deadly the virus was. And so we had to do things to keep crews safe. And uh, we really hit the, hit the road running. Many of our employees were able to work from home and each still are working from home. We did tremendous outreach in the community. We helped 20,000 customers, not just individuals, but also small businesses uh, that couldn't pay their power bill. We, we worked with them and we're, we still are working with them. And now that there's some government programs to help them pay those bills, we're working with them to, to help them uh, get all that paperwork submitted and, and have that happen. So, you know, someone told me, imagine, you know, this pandemic is so horrible, we're all at home. Now imagine it without power. 
you know, it's uh, so. Um, and then we we were able to do a lot of projects because so much of what we do is outside. So we did we did uh, keep up many of our, our capital projects on both our power and our water system. So this is one of my favorite graphics because um, this is another thing people don't really understand. They don't understand where our energy comes from. So most of it is from hydroelectric. Some of that is from, a lot of that's from Bonneville and some of that's from our, our own uh, local generation. So we have the Jackson Hydro Project that uh, takes water out of Spada Lake. Spada Lake is a source of probably 70% of the drinking water in the county. It's uh, the water, it goes to the city of Everett. The PUD buys water from them. I know even the city of Arlington buys some of their water from time to time from, from the PUD, from the Spada Lake system. And then we have some small projects, uh, really interesting projects called run of the river projects where we, uh, we take the water from a very small stream way above where any salmon can ever get to. And we uh, pipe it down part way down the stream as much as a couple of thousand vertical feet to build a thousand pounds of pressure and run that small amount of water at high pressure through turbines. And we generate power and we turn it back into the creek. So then up in uh, Darrington, we take power from the Hampton Lumber Mill biomass facility. So the, the biomass from their, their milling operations gets turned into electricity. And then an interesting one is in Monroe, we have the Qualco a biodigester. And we're just, we're in the process of taking over operating that, but that's essentially uh, cow manure that gets turned into methane that gets burned in, uh, in a generator to make power. And then lastly, most recently, just a short distance away from us, we have the Arlington Community Solar Project, which I'm very proud of. So that was an opportunity for um, anyone that's a PUD customer to buy shares in community solar for people that can't purchase their solar from Joan it's just another way to take part of solar without having the panels on your roof. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but this is about the utility of the future and the direction not only our PUD is going, but many PUDs across the nation. So at the left are some of those sources of power I talked about, um, energy storage. The PUD is actually uh, was a leader. It had one of the first battery batteries um, to store energy. And then the, another thing I'll talk about here in a few minutes is advanced metering. So advanced metering is coming to our area and that is really going to help us do a lot of things to transform the utility and how you can interact with utility. So right now we're doing some pilots to, to see um, how uh, interested people might be in time of day rates, how those kinds of things work. Um, and I'll give you a great example of of all these kinds of future things are gonna be win-wins. So uh, we're using the carrot, not the stick. So for instance, if you own an electric vehicle, if you buy one of those new F-150s, you can plug your saw into, it would benefit us if you charge that in the middle of the night. And you probably don't care if it's charging in the middle of the night because you're asleep. So there's a win-win. We'll be able to provide a lower rate for you to charge it, you'll save money, and it'll help us uh, manage our peaks because it's our peaks that are the challenge to becoming 100% clean. You notice on the previous slide, we're 98% clean, um, but by 2045, we have to become 100% clean and we're very close, obviously. So managing those peaks will be a lot. And then there's just a lot of new um, uh, building management systems that are gonna be coming online who, that'll integrate with utilities. Um, and so, let me talk to you about Connect Up. So this is our advanced metering system that uh, will we'll start, the meters will be deployed starting in 2023. So right now we really have a dumb system. We don't know if the power is on at your house. We don't know how much power you're using right now. Um, we know it switches and stuff, how much power there is. And so we can often tell if a neighborhood is out. We can't tell if a specific house is out. And so we send out, we have 2,200, square miles of service territory, we, as you know, we send out meter readers uh, once a month to read all the meters. So this is technology that will read meters uh, every 15 minutes, will immediately alert us if the power is out or if the power is back on at your home. But this will allow us to do um, 
these specialized kind of rates to help you have a lower rate for charging an electric vehicle, for example. Question. Yes. So uh, are you uh, any homeowner going to have a say on if these meters get installed or not? There is an opt-out program. If people don't want the meter, there is an opt-out program. Because mine's the old dial type that I know how to read. <laughs> and I track you guys all the time. So, <laughs> Well, this one's got digital numbers, so it's even easier to read. Oh, yeah, but I don't trust them. Uh, anyway, this will allow us to uh, deploy new rate designs. And there's a lot of other things. So, you know, when service changes, think an apartment complex, right, where several people are moving in on a weekend or something, we have to send meter readers out there to read those meters when service is disconnected. We have to send meter readers out there to read meters when it's connected. We'll be able to just call up on the phone and we'll be able to turn on the power at a new location. Yes. you know, uh, you know, something maybe was wrong, like maybe the refrigerator was, would that be something you guys would also be alerted to and maybe help out the homeowner? Yeah, we, we will be in a situation to alert anomalous energy use or water use, right? So this would be for the water utility too. So if you've got a broken pipe and your water's running, you're on vacation, we could send you a text message and say, you know, your water's been running continuously. FYI, if you want to ask a question, hold your hand up, I'll give you the mic. Another question right over here, Paul. Okay. Okay, great. So I want to talk a little bit about the Arlington microgrid, which is just a short distance down here, right next to the, uh, the solar array. So this is a project that we did in part from a, a $3.5 million grant from the, the state of Washington. So it's the solar array that you hopefully have seen. It's a uh, a one megawatt lithium ion battery for storage. And a microgrid is a system, it's much, it's sort of the modern equivalent to emergency backup generators the hospital has. This is a seamless system that power can be powered by the grid or it can be powered by the microgrid. And these are becoming more common and this will help us understand uh, better how to work with these kinds of systems. But there's also some other interesting things we're doing there. We're, we're going to uh, work with the vehicle manufacturer. We're going to work on vehicle to grid charging, which is sort of an emerging technology. This is where uh, you, you plug your car in and you can, the utility can draw power from the car or put power back into the car, sort of to help to balance out loads. So this is a technology that's um, just in its infancy, but you can imagine as electric cars get more common, these are the kinds of things that might help customers and utilities. To, uh, to become more uh, clean or energy efficient or help manage peak loads. The other thing that's gonna be there is a backup data, uh, backup data system. So part of what we're working on is to have more resiliency and the, the big bridge that comes over the Snohomish River in the event of an earthquake could be challenging to provide service to both sides. And so we have backup data and we're gonna be building our new office that'll be for uh, Stanwood, Camino and Arlington. So the Arlington office will eventually close down and we're gonna have many more service crews up here. And so part of that's for resiliency. Part of that is just, frankly, it's hard to get out of Everett and traffic and get up here to, to respond with more equipment. So, and then lastly, we'll have the Clean Energy Center there. That is uh, part of the grant and that's where uh, school kids or others can take field trips and learn about microgrid, clean energy, solar power, those kinds of things. So I'm very proud that that's right here in Arlington. So talked about electric vehicles a little bit. Uh, you know, all the manufacturers are betting big on electric vehicles, are investing billions, and we're expecting exponential growth in, in electric vehicles. And so we're really working to optimize our system. Part of that will come from these meters. Uh, so, you know, a recent example in my neighborhood, a transformer blew out when it got hot. Crew came out, put a new transformer. Next time it gets hot, went out again. And the reason for that is, is we know how much power we sell that people hooked up on a transformer in a month, but we don't know what the peaks are. Again, it's that dumb system. So typically those systems have been overbuilt, but as people add things, heat pumps and stuff like that, 
we have to build a better system to make sure we can handle things like car charging and and uh, and those kinds of things. Um, anyway, let's see. Well, that was it. I, I wasn't sure how much time I had. So, yes, Dwayne. It's so. Oh. I'll let everybody ask, and then maybe my questions will be answered. It's too bad. That was probably well, an easy question. With, with every passing day, uh, electrons are doing more for us. Uh, so we're increasingly dependent on the flow of electricity. Uh, can you comment on cybersecurity and what you see as things that the local utility is doing or the industry is doing to try to ensure that people that want to mess with that uh, get thwarted? <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And we are doing a lot. It's very challenging. We actually are working, we've been working with the National Guard for the last few years in Washington to help uh, actually have them hack into our systems. Um, we've hosted uh, cybersecurity summits the last several years, which big companies like T-Mobile and others have participated in. You know, there's no guarantees, uh, but I know that we're really doing as much as we can, uh, you know, a lot of the systems that run um, run the switches and stuff aren't connected to the other systems that get hacked into. And and the utility does all kinds of things. I get spoofing emails from the utility, so they're because the number one weakness is is staff opening emails and those kinds of things. So they ping us every once in a while, and and I haven't failed yet, but day's not over. It's a great question. It's a really important topic. Yes. Two, two questions Mike. real quick. Um, the Bonneville Dam, is that the main source or is there five dams? Is there oh, there's how many dams in the system? I think there's about 15 or so. You, okay. We hear a lot about this, the, the four Snake River, lower Snake River dams. So that's part of the Bonneville system. Oh, okay. So this is all the federal dams from the Snake River all the way down to nice. uh, the big dam at the end of the the main okay. question I had personally was if we were to have an outage, like an extended outage for some reason, is there programs for solar that you guys recommend or battery backup? Uh, Cause I use a uh, generators right now with, you know, fuel. Yeah, I would say that we recommend, we, um, we help our customers understand solar. I mean, you've got your expert right here, Joan, who sounds like she's built in a house that sounds like it can, it can do exactly what you're talking about. So, yeah, I would reach out to Joan. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, did I understand that we're th that the Snohomish PUD is number thirteen in the in the nation? It is in size. Why, why is that? Uh, how can that be? Well, public power is huge. Uh, this is a very populous county. So, um, you know, many large cities are are not public power. Uh, notable ones that are are Los Angeles. Uh, but it's it's much more common in the northwest because of the hydro system than it is in other parts so a lot of public power is just a very small municipalities all throughout the nation so yeah yes mine might not be an easy question yeah, good <laughs> i deserve it ask me a hard one so, no, uh, i mean because i grew up in india and like i mean i was actually there like a few months ago mm -hmm. and then like i was in a rural village like where they actually have actual like Prop. I mean, like they don't have power, so they we, they had a lot of alternative solutions, and they're using the solar power mm -hmm. uh, and all that stuff. So, is there information that we can get that is available for public and for children? Like, I mean, personally, like I'm in, interested mm -hmm. more in, interested in like understanding like what's happening around the world. Here we are blessed, right? Like, I mean, we have water, we have everything. Mm -hmm. But then there is so much more that we can learn from the other countries and other places like where we can use alternative uh, power sources, I guess. So is there a place where we can get that information? Well, we can get I, there's, online. For, there's a place the online UK. on the website where, where I can give you my business card and we can get you information uh, about you know, what's available here to us. You brought up children, you know, the, the PUD has a whole outreach for educators. So this past year, we've been making uh, education modules to teach children about clean energy, energy conservation, all those kinds of things. 
So I don't know if Arlington Schools has been partaking of that or not, but we actually have a, a we actually have a teacher on staff to help help those kinds of things. So, Sid, is I know the PD is explored, but tidal power. I know they were looking into that at one point. Did it ever get any traction? No, you know that was before my time, and I don't remember if it was a, a permitting issue or a cost. I think I think they lost some federal some federal money. Obviously, anytime anything is in motion, you can make energy out of it. And so I'm sure tidal power will be will be looked at again in the future. Two things. First one, uh, nuclear power, is that coming from SATSEP or is that coming somewhere else? That's all coming from the Columbia Generating Station uh, up near Richland. That's the only nuclear power reactor in the state. And then the other thing is uh, my company used three PUD grants. Uh, I would not have done the projects without them, but they were totally uh, well worth the money to, to invest in them. Um, you might want to expand on the PUD grants. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I just know the grants that were available when I was working for the school district. I don't really get into it. But, you know, like I said, we were able to relight gymnasiums. So we were able to relight for our labor, for the dist school district's labor, the, the grant covered enough to buy all the equipment. So all we were supplying was the labor. And so I remember one summer we did all of Eagle Creek. We hired two summer people and taught them how to swap out ballast and, and change out bulbs. And we relighted an entire building in the summer. So uh, there's a lighting center that is associated with the grants that helps design the appropriate lighting. So I think I get the last question um, over here. Oh. My last question, <laughs> and it, if it's too long for a short answer, feel free to take a hard pass. We can talk later. But okay. I'm curious, I'm hearing from lots of people that work at PUD about the opportunity that is there for people that need help with addiction instead of just being canned and on the way out, how the company supports them and keeps people employed. Well, you know, that's a human resources. I've never had that question before. I don't know the answer to that. Well, I'll give one last question. Crypto okay. mining. Crypto mining uses a lot of power. Uh, what's good? The world wants to go to crypto mining. What are we going to do out here? I'll get you a card though to get get your question answered. Uh, so crypto mining. Uh, well, I hate to say it. It's it's our power is a little too expensive for crypto miners. So crypto miners. Uh, really need really inexpensive power. And so sort of the, some of the mid-sea utilities that have their own dams that uh, really almost uh, their commercial customers supplant their residential customers. Uh, you know, it's a crazy thing in a time when we're trying to go carbon free to have money being made using massive amounts, amounts of electricity. It's just, a, it's just the most bizarre thing. <laughs> it, it, it's using massive commuter computer uh, power to solve extremely complex equations that result in getting um, digital currency. Is that is that close? That's good. That's good. Okay. Anything else? That's I think that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sid. Thank you to our guests that have joined us online. Joy, Carrie, still on there. Corey Duskin, favorite guest. And uh, if there's not anything else for the good of the order, go change the world.